Hello everybody, my name is Elisa Baum. I am Preconus Director of Product Marketing. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I'd like to conduct a bit of housekeeping. If you would, please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know that you hear me. And let me see here. I see some hands. Okay, thank you very much. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we'll take as much time uh, to answer as many questions as possible. Actually, we'll take what time is left to answer as many questions as possible. And those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog entry on Percona's MySQL performance blog. In addition, everybody will get a webinar recording URL, um, as well as links to the slide within 48 hours. And with that said, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, Architecture and Design of MySQL-Powered Applications, proudly being presented today by Pacona CEO and founder, Peter Zaitsev. And with that said, I'd like to turn the floor over to Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you, Lisa. Good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. And today we'll talk about the architecture and design of MySQL-Powered Applications. Okay, why isn't switching the slides for me? Okay, and that's how it crashes, right? No, okay, it works now. That's when you uh, know what may happen sometimes. Uh, anyway, so uh, in this presentation, what we'll look at is uh, essentially three basic things. First of all, one uh, will cover what is in your toolbox when it comes to uh, the, your architecture design process. Then we'll look into what questions you should ask to find the, the architecture which is right for exactly your situation. And finally, we'll look at some of the most common MySQL architecture patterns which you can use. Now, before we go to all of that, I wanted to take a look at this uh, picture, which is essentially their design of the live journal, as we posted about 10 years ago. And what I think is amazing about this picture is what we can see that 10 years ago, which is a long, long time in technology, we see an uh, architecture which is uh, very similar to what we can often see today. We can see there is uh, using of a memcache uh, for caching. We can see using a master and slave for a read write uh, splitting for uh, getting more reads. And we see the user clusters uh, on this picture, which are uh, used of a, uh, of a sharding technology. These are something which is very, uh, very uh, uh, commonly used today. So, the 10 years ago, we had all of those uh, technologies already used in the MySQL architectures. And what does this uh, simple history lesson tell us? Well, it tells us what really the MySQL is quite mature and there are some battle tested architecture uh, pattern which exists which know they work and uh, they allow us to build and operate a successful applications through, uh, for many years. Most problems have those proven solutions which you can essentially just uh, go ahead, take uh, uh, and run. And this is uh, very valuable if you are uh, looking to build their application uh, by minimizing your risk as much as possible. Now, certain things uh, have been changed and let's see what exactly exists right now and how it is different from uh, what existed a few years ago. Well, first of all, we have much, much more powerful hardware those days. Then, uh, if you would delete that uh, live journal presentation 10 years ago, they used a very powerful service at that time, which contained about 16 gigabytes of memory. Now, in the relatively inexpensive commodity boxes, we can fit uh, half a terabyte of memory and sometimes even more. We also have storage, which became uh, much, much faster than before. Previously, you can get their uh, RAID with set of hard drives, and maybe you will be able to get uh, uh, th thousands of IOPS on the commodity hardware. Right now, we can get hundreds of thousands of IOPS and actually more and often we are limited about how much IO capacity from the storage MySQL is able to utilize efficiently. They ask uh, how much of uh, 
uh, I/O capacity that uh, storage provides, especially when we look at those very powerful PCI Express flash storage. The latency, which is also very important, have also dropped a couple of orders of magnitude, where we can have I/O latency of uh, the less than a tenth of a millisecond those days. We also have much more in CPU cores. CPUs, of course, became faster, but they also became a lot uh, wider uh, those days, allowing us to really package much uh, more CPU power uh, in a single box. We also have changes in the uh, software, which became, well, it became better. If you think about the MySQL, a Linux kernel, the file systems we have, all of them have been uh, improved in a way how we are able to get use of this very powerful hardware uh, which is uh, available. A few years ago, we have been battling, for example, with MySQL being able to utilize your four cores effectively. And, uh, for example, by using Percona server, you could get uh, double performance or even more in some cases. Now, if you look at the most recent MySQL uh, releases, unless you have some very exotic workload, it already scales very well when it comes to their uh, CPU cores amount of memory or powerful I.O. storage. Next, what have changed is what we have a cloud. And the cloud, I think, is uh, very important because it allows us to have architectures, uh, we have a dynamic scalability. If we need a new server, we can get it almost instantly, while in the older mentality, it would typically take days or sometimes even weeks or months planning if you can uh, get more server capacity. That also allows us to get the throwaway server mentality, which is uh, uh, wonderful for operations. That means if something is mm, going on wrong with a server, which you can just get another one from a cloud and throw it away without trying to figure out wherever that's some uh, crazy hardware bug we're dealing with uh, or uh, something else. It also allows us to be more efficient in in the operations and have more um, less risky environment uh, changes. For example, if I want to migrate to the new MySQL version those days, I can just build uh, essentially a clone of my architecture having one master and several slaves at the new MySQL version, test it, switch over to that and then discard the old servers just paying for a couple of uh, weeks of the runtime which was really uh, uh, previously uh, impossible. It also al allows us uh, agility for being able to access the data uh, faster and much less uh, uh, involved operation because uh, cloud allows us to really take the uh, automation to the next level. Automation itself is uh, very important uh, on its own, and if you look at this uh, uh, at their successful application architecture uh, those days, not just the MySQL one, you will see what they really automate everything. We see a lot of automation in development, automation in testing, in deployment, and uh, as well as in uh, in operation. So we can have as many things done with as little as a human times as possible, which is very important because we are every day dealing with larger and more complicated systems, so maintaining them manually becomes truly impossible. Then what we have is new languages and frameworks. And a lot of change those days, of course, is, is building the frameworks and languages which allow us to be more agile and build function applications and a good applications in very short time. What also have changed is what we have to write less what I will call system code. I remember when I started doing uh, development in uh, late 90s uh, with PHP, then myself, as everybody else, would start with uh, writing something like database abstraction library. 
because you don't want to use functions like MySQL, Connect, and so on directly in your code spread for your application. Well, now we don't have to do that. We don't have to do these and any other uh, low-level functions and uh, uh, powerful frameworks typically provide us much easier to use high-level interface about how to access and deal with, the, uh, with data. We also have much more client-side development. Right? If you look at the modern applications, they would, uh, in a web, for example, they would have a lot more code written in, uh, uh, in the JavaScript, which is indicated on the uh, client side and just accesses the web server and database as a result of that to get a little bit more, more data. And what, uh, why that is important is because a lot of uh, more modern developers those days, they are not so close to the databases uh, anymore. And the MySQL and database may, may come as an afterthought uh, for them. We see the less database dependence in the applications and if you, uh, because of using frameworks, we can often move uh, application from one database uh, to another or in some cases even going from an SQL uh, engine to some no SQL solution. And which is done by, uh, in many cases, through ORM and the equivalent, which is again very uh, important because it helps us from one side to uh, empower uh, developers to be more effective. From other side, it introduces the extra level and reduces transparency. So we, we can often have a lot of MySQL issues come from how ORM level works and how their, what developer is logically doing is translated to a database level. We also have to deal with multiple clients. Again, years ago we would have a desktop web browsers and that would be, that would be the only client which is using your application. Those days we have to deal with desktop web browsers, mobile web browsers, we often have to deal with uh, apps right, for your uh, smartphone or, or wherever and we also often have to uh, provide exposable API in the modern world, a lot of applications are used as a, a platform so they coordinate with other uh, applications to provide this ultimate user experience. You can think about Facebook API, for example, or Twitter API, right? Lots of APIs, uh, uh, which is how our uh, application is really being used. Now, if you look at the modern uh, applications, you also see what it becomes not only MySQL. You can uh, still see MySQL as a very good and uh, uh, safe choice for this uh, OLTP operational relational database, but it's often supplemented by other technologies. That can be Memcache or uh, Redis for, for some transient data store or caching, RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ for QN. Cassandra and MongoDB, Hadoop. Even in uh, in the database world, we see uh, MySQL is not uh, good at every job. For certain things, you would be looking for column storage engines, like those exist for MySQL, or even other solutions. Like we see, Vertica is quite uh, popular among our customers for their analytics being used for MySQL. Another uh, change which is very important is what we have a lot of pretty good high ability options for MySQL those days. And I think high ability is a very important because it really is something which is important for all application sizes. There are things like sharding or scaling to tremendous amount of CPU core or memory is only important for some applications which are substantially large. The HA being up is important for almost any applications, right? Most of applications those days are run 24 by 7 and they suffer if they go down. So what do I have ability options do we have those days? We have a pretty mature MySQL uh, replication, much uh, better than it was uh, ever before. We have uh, solutions based on their uh, synchronous replication uh, Galeric technology such as Perconex Ruby cluster. 
We have MySQL cluster, which also have been very much improved over the last years, especially in its uh, ability to execute uh, complicated queries, in addition to uh, uh, being served uh, the, the simple queries that always uh, was doing pretty well. And what we also have is uh, uh, a lot of database as a server vendors in the cloud, they have certain proprietary high ability solutions. If you go to guys like Amazon, with Amazon RDS or to Google, they have some uh, proprietary high ability solutions for MySQL, which is uh, extremely easy for you to set up and use. Beyond high ability, there are also many new solutions for replication management. Right? How you do failover, or how do you really utilize your slaves uh, to, for uh, doing reads uh, and things like that? We have been working a lot of solutions. MHA and PRM. There is a third-party solution, uh, continuing tungsten, which can really simplify replication management. There is also work going on uh, at the Oracle with having the MySQL replication utilities, which is uh, great tools for replication if you use MySQL 5.6 with uh, GT IDs. We also have a, a lot of work being done on making sharding better. Like sharding or sort of manually splitting your database across many hosts is essentially the default choice for scaling MySQL. If you look at any large scale environment, right, going 10 years back to LiveJournal or those days with uh, uh, Twitter or Facebook, they use Shrugging as some of its uh, variant to, to the portion which uses MySQL. There are a number of solutions which are designed for making Shrugging, uh, Shrugging better. This see the Clustrix, MemSQL, ScaleDB as a proprietary solution in the MySQL space, uh, which are uh, not quite MySQL to the fullest extent, but they are uh, can provide you something MySQL uh, compatible. There are a number of proxy solutions, both proprietary and open source, such as ScaleArc, ScaleBase, Tesora, or MySQL proxy. Max scale proxy SQL, which can help you uh, on a proxy level making share, sharing more possible. And we also see the number of open source frameworks through the years, which uh, help us to make uh, sharding more easy to manage from the application side. We have been a solution as a VTES and JetPan through the year, and I think the most watched uh, technology for sharding management those days is a MySQL fabric. We just uh, uh, went GA a couple of years ago, or a couple of weeks ago, and it's uh, very actively uh, being developed uh, by the MySQL team, uh, uh, team at Oracle. So I think there are, there are great things to come with this technology. Now, as we discuss uh, about what we have in uh, our toolbox and how things have changed, now let's look about what kind of architecture questions you, if you're in the seat of your uh, architect, should be asking. Let's start with basics. First of all, you want to make some of the right decisions early, very early in the application because some of the poor choices, if you do the wrong decisions early on, can be very expensive to fix. Believe me, there's like so many customers coming our ways where we would come to us with applications which was launched or about to launch, and we look at that and say, oh my gosh, if you would only talk to us six months ago or a year ago when you start designing that, then we would give you some couple of basic advices how you could have done it better so you don't have a problems you're having right now. And now it becomes very expensive to ship because, uh, to change it because uh, you essentially have to rebuild the ship while selling, which is always tough and risky. Another thing I think to, uh, to understand, as you came uh, to your application, especially in your application, especially if you haven't built something exactly like that before, is what you will uh, not have a perfect understanding about your application architecture 
uh, its features, its use cases. And that means that your first architecture will not be perfect. Be ready for that, right? And don't try to make everything uh, everything perfect because you will just waste a lot of time and you can't get that, uh, that right, uh, everything right. Now, uh, I mentioned about uh, asking for advice, and I wanted to give you, you some, my advice about the uh, consultants uh, uh, use and bring in third party expert where we choose Pure Corner or somebody else to help with our architecture design. My take is what consultants are to some extent as lawyers. And what I mean by that is, well, I am very careful about how much money I spend on lawyers because I know after spending let's say ten thousand dollars on some engagement I get a lot of feedback and the opportunity to spend hundred thousand dollars more to research some things for me to do with the risk have been identified and so on and so forth. So I know that can be a rat hole which will take a lot of uh, a lot of cost but at the same time I know what if I don't involve lawyers in some of the key decisions that uh, that uh, maybe some very costly mistakes for me uh, which uh, I should have avoided. And I see consultants can often be used in exactly the same way when there are certain key critical decisions you want to get advice. You maybe even have to uh, want to get more than one advice if you are about to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars on the uh, application development and deployment. Now, as we look at the architecture, there are few dimensions which I think are very important to consider. One is application scale, right? Because not all applications will be done to the same scale. Are you planning to uh, do their next Facebook or I will just launch in the web store for the local uh, cafe in your town. They don't have even nearly the same scale requirements. What is your requirements of high ability? That is another component which, uh, which very much impacts your application architecture. And you also have to be thinking about the team experience. Right, and what kind of team you have. Because you can have a perfect architecture on paper, but if it will be too complicated for your uh, team to implement and follow operationally, you will fail. And you always have to be very main, uh, mindful about that. When it comes to the scaling, my approach uh, here is as follows. First, I think it's very, very important to avoid over-engineering. Because over-engineering is uh, is very expensive and it often can uh, not only have a cost immediate which are just building that application and the opportunity cost where you take a lot longer time to deploy application to the market but also long time uh, long term cost maintaining that because over engineers complex applications are very expensive to maintain and to change at the same time you need to give yourself some runway you may be doing relatively simple architecture, but you want to know what you are not going to uh, run into a wall tomorrow and collapse under the uh, number of users who try to use your application. Because it, it may be very hard to, uh, to, to recover from and you may have a very bad experience for some of your uh, or users. And as the outcome of that, you want to do at least some capacity planning. planning. Maybe not exact, but at least uh, capacity planning, testing, benchmarks, to have a feel to say, okay, I'm looking at the system and I'm confident that my architecture can handle double the load, or triple the load, which will enough for me for uh, runway over, let's say, a uh, few months or it could be different time depending on the pace of your development. So you can come up with solutions uh, you need to take the application to the next level, if you indeed need to do that. Hiveability. Well, the thing to understand about hiveability is what the real hiveability. I mean, you think about like a spaceship like hiveability is really, really expensive because it requires all the angles, not just your good software and uh, uh, hardware and software like MySQL. You have to 
have your software you have to have uh, operational practices and change management and so on and so forth. And it is all expensive even besides what technology is getting better. But at the same time, if you are not looking this kind of availability, but you just don't want your website to go up if one of the boxes in the cloud died, that's what I would call like a medium level of high availability, is getting more and more simple and affordable. And you can get those uh, this pretty easy those days. Finally, what you often need to know is what it is your people or people in general is the leading cause of downtime those days. Because both hardware what we are dealing with, Linux or our operating system and MySQL itself are pretty mature and uh, stable. So in majority of cases, uh, the high ability can be caused by either developers, let's say pushing the buggy code which kills the database, right, or uh, overloads the systems, or uh, operations people on certain level which make a mistakes by pulling out their own hard drive and plugging their own power cord, right, or uh, running the drop database on a different system. Now, let's talk about their uh, team experience. What is very important here is what you choose solution which your team can uh, can support, right? And and uh, that is uh, is a very uh, very uh, uh, important because some solutions which are good in theory may not be the most practical for the team which you actually have. To give you a good example, uh, in some cases, uh, I mean, I really like running MySQL on Linux. I uh, know it best, but there have been teams which are very well trained and the Solaris is operating system which I have been using for 10 years or more, right? In this case, for those people, continue running MySQL on Solaris may uh, make the best uh, uh, best choice. So when we look about the team uh, experience, you also have to be looking about your development and uh, operational process, and think about the developers and how well do they understand databases, or how much support you need to. Uh, uh, to, uh, to provide them. So one of the important things what we found is what bad queries often kill the database in terms of performance and uh, what you need to ensure is what part of your process is having to systematically find and review those queries. You want to do that in their development or QA environment so you can review the new queries, but you also want to do that in production in case something slips through. For years we had a tool called Pircona Toolkit, which is a wonderful tool for uh, analyzing the, the queries. And now we also have a tool called uh, Pircona Cloud Tools, which is a web-based interface which uh, provides even more features in terms of process support for your developers and operations team to work together to uh, review the queries and uh, ensure your MySQL is uh, running well. The next thing I like to think about the architectures is uh, simplicity. Right? If everything else is equals, you want to look for simple architectures with uh, fewer components than possible. Why is that? Well, because the few components you have, there is less uh, complexity is, and it lowers the cost. Because each component will have to have some experience, even if, if uh, internally in your team, right, or contracted out uh, to monitor that, to troubleshoot, to optimize, to set up, and so on and so forth, right? And you also have to often watch how those different components are. Uh, interacting be, be between each other. As you're choosing solutions to uh, to be part of your simple architecture, I think it's very important to know what there is a safety in numbers. And what that means is you want to follow the crowd unless you have very big and specific uh, reason not to. What that means is use what everybody else is using a very proven track record and community experience of people being uh, being successful. Some of us 
yes, indeed, we have some very unusual exotic or new needs and we may have to use some bleeding edge uh, technologies or even implement something in-house. But I would suggest that to be left only when it's actually needed. To. Now, we spoke about the scale. And I uh, mentally like to divide the world of a MySQL power application in two big groups. Big applications, you know, things, things Facebook, and a small applications. Things like the MySQL performance block, uh, for example. And what is very important to note is what majority of our applications are really small. Small in the sense of what you can really run them on the single MySQL database instance if you want. You may probably have more than one instance for case uh, for caching, right, for development, but it could run a single MySQL instance, especially with support of, of caching. And what is important, what such small applications does not mean what they are insignificant. I know a case about their uh, internet size, for example, for, for a company of uh, more than 200,000 employees, which is being such a small applications. Or e-commerce sites, which are supporting more than uh, $10 million a month in sales, but being really small uh, when it comes to their uh, database backend. And here I think it's uh, worth to see uh, what kind of math you, do, you can do to understand that. If you look at the modern MySQL instance, it can typically handle 100,000 of relatively simple queries a second. And this is not some peak invented number, right? If you will go to their uh, MySQL website and you'll read some of the benchmarks, you will see the claims of, of running a million of queries a second, right, of order of magnitude more. Well, I am being conservative here, right? If you look at 10, 10 users, uh, oh, 20 queries per user interaction, which is kind of about the average, then we can handle about 5,000 of user interactions per second. And uh, in this case, uh, even if you are uh, looking for a peak between your low time and high time, right, we are approximately could be thinking about serving about 10 million users, active daily users, right, at the medium engagement from a single MySQL instance. This is a lot. 10 million active daily users, that's a very, uh, a very big number, right, and I, and I think uh, uh, if uh, people start thinking about that, they uh, recognize that those very simple architectures in MySQL often allows us to support very significant uh, applications and we often can go well beyond the proof of concept of such architecture and only start complicating things when we are really getting attraction and getting a lot of money to invest into uh, such process. So now let's move on and talk about some of the practical choices we have in terms of the uh, basic architecture environments. First, Let's think, what is a baseline? What is a baseline what we can uh, use as a starting out? Well, it's a single MySQL instance. There is no cache and no availability, and we're not using any supplemental technology. Right, the first question you probably should be asking is, OK, I need availability. Going down for a long time, right, is not an option. And the three simple choices, what I would point out for availability is, even using database as a service, such as Amazon RDS, which has a very uh, simple built-in proprietary availability. You can build MySQL availability with uh, MySQL replication using the tools I mentioned, such as Perfone Replication Manager, MHA, or MySQL uh, replication utilities. And this is also a road which uh, thousands uh, or have walked before you and there is a lot of experience uh, about how to do that. And you can also use the high ability for Conex RDB cluster, which allow, uh, provides you a pathway for uh, very good cluster-like high ability where you can build a cluster with multiple nodes, which you can read to any, from any node, write to any node, and it uh, really behaves as what you would expect from a cluster while being backed up by our conventional 
MySQL uh, in a DB storage engine. Now, when it comes to question to the scale, what do we need uh, the, to scale, right? And then it comes to scaling the application, we typically uh, have to think about the three distinct components here, which you may need to scale all together or just one of them. One is scaling reads, right? And you have um, some applications such as new size, for example, maybe getting uh, a lot of uh, more reads when they become, uh, become popular, right? Then there is a potential of scaling writes. And the third one is scaling the data size. In some applications, as it grows, the data size can be uh, growing significantly, sometimes even faster than the amount of users. In others, it's not the case. You have to understand which exactly from those you have to scale, and chances are uh, it's, uh, it's all of them. Uh, when it comes to managing uh, the load, I think it's important what, uh, if your system is not keeping up with the load yet, right, as you've done your capacity planning, you uh, really can be thinking about a couple of things here. One is really kind of a scaling the system, which is a very powerful approach. But also, you can see how you can uh, move the load in time and in space, right? When you're speaking about in time, uh, what that means is certain transactions, they can be moved away from the peak load to their uh, uh, other kind of load. You can use queuing to uh, delay some things a little bit, or you can do things as a batch process in which you do at night to uh, to offload, to shave a lot of load from a peak uh, in many cases. You also sometimes can move it uh, is so much as in space. For example, when you are using, uh, having some reports and other heavy but not m m uh, supplemental queries, often it makes sense to move that uh, to a slave instead of your, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, critical operational database. Now, I mentioned QN, and I think that is a very, uh, very important one, because if you look at the any uh, high-end uh, architecture, uh, it would use QN to some extent. It really helps us a lot. It uh, helps us to deal with a load spike, it allows to increase uh, reliability, and often it also allows us to uh, scale the parts of the systems which are uh, really ex uh, having a high load instead of have to build up the, uh, the whole system all together. There are many solutions for that. RabbitMQ, Redis, Gearman, uh, which is a little bit different thing, but I uh, put it in, in the same group, or solutions as a uh, zero MQ. Now, from those uh, solutions about scaling reads, uh, uh, writes, and data size, Scaling reads can be often done by replication, with read-write splitting. You can set up several slaves and you can set the reads on them with scaling uh, your read capacity multiple times. You can implement caching from memcache, redis, or even your uh, some level of HTTP level cache like varnish and reduce uh, drastically a level of reads uh, what mice will have to deal with. Or you can uh, set up solution like your Conex Ruby cluster which is uh, wonderful because you can read anywhere without uh, caring about their uh, replication lag if you uh, set it up appropriately. When it comes to scaling writes, then you have essentially a couple of approaches here with MySQL. One is what is called a functional partitioning. You can use different services or different systems, tiers, whatever, for different part of the application. So, for example, uh, I mentioned the new site already, right? And uh, in that case, you often would have something as tracking what your applications have been up to, what they have viewed, and so on and so forth. I may have that functionality moved to their uh, different database, right, for login and uh, analysis, and keep that separate from my uh, database of their um, articles, which I can keep small uh, uh, and tight. 
or I can, can keep my discussion forum separate from uh, my uh, main company website and so on and so forth. And then there is always uh, the sharding, which is essentially horizontal partitioning over many servers, right, as we uh, discussed many high-end applications using this technology. Now, when it comes to scaling the data size, uh, the question comes, okay, we know we can use multiple MySQL instances. Now, when it comes to single MySQL instance, how much do we, uh, can we store in a single MySQL instance those days? And uh, this number indeed have been growing a lot over uh, last years. I remember, let's say years ago, maybe 10 years ago, getting more than 100 gigabytes in database, maybe, you know, 2, 3 gigabytes was quite a, a inconvenient. Then we go to their uh, terabytes, and I think uh, right now, uh, in the best cases, you may store up to 10 terabytes per single MySQL instance and, uh, and, be, uh, and be successful. Now, how is that possible and what's needed for that? Well, one of the issues we often had with dealing with large data on the single MySQL instance is what we could not change that, right? We could not uh, alter the table to add the index or add the column. So now we have a solution for online schema change. There is solution in MySQL 5.6 as well as their one and two corner toolkit for PT online schema change, which can allow us to rebuild the tables if you have to with mm, very mm, low impact. Now we also mm, often have been bounded or grounded to the small database sizes with a backup needs. If I cannot backup or restore my database, well, uh, I can't really run so much data on a single box. Now we have a pretty fast backups. We have a very good solutions for physical level backups, being either per corner extra backup or MySQL enterprise backups, or modern file systems and volume managers, being that ZFS, uh, uh, LVM, right, or if you're in the cloud using EBS, you can take the snapshots uh, very quickly and you can also restore those snapshots for uh, your operational database very quickly as well. We also have a fast networks. If you are running with a large database sizes, you want to, uh, to be running 10 gigabit ne uh, networks, which is uh, affordable. Because often, if, uh, you wouldn't need really that much for your normal MySQL traffic, right? I mean, uh, one gigabit is a lot when you're just having tiny queries going back and forth. But then you will need to restore your database quickly. That is where you have a tremendous difference between uh, one uh, gigabit connection and, and 10 gigabits. If you don't have 10 gigabits uh, in your data center, at least look at some uh, the trunk connections, having two, maybe four, or uh, often to the same server, so you can uh, uh, really have fast uh, the access to data when you need that. We also have a very high performance storage in those days, which is again very important because when you're speaking about those very large databases, you will be IU bound, at least for certain workloads. And uh, their fast storage, especially PCI Express storage, such as uh, uh, solutions from Fusion IO or uh, Virident they really allow you to have tons of IOPS, so even if you have to go to the disk and do the IO, you don't have to suffer that badly in your application. Finally, we are uh, having the mm, compression technologies uh, available for MySQL uh, right now, which is uh, really uh, wonderful. It can get you a lot of uh, logical data and then package that into much smaller uh, amount of data on the disk, which allows us to deal with less data on backups, it allows us to uh, pay less for our high performance storage and so on and so forth. There is a compression in InnoDB tables which became uh, relatively mature in uh, MySQL uh, 5.6 and using this technology you can 
often get uh, a 2x uh, compression. And there is also TokuDB, which is a different storage engine which uh, uses uh, a different compression algorithm which can get you much uh, better compression. We have seen in the real world application compression ranging from 3x to uh, 10x if you're using TokuDB uh, engine. So that really can uh, get you a lot more from your system if you're bound by data science. So, uh, getting to our summary. If there are a few things I want you to take away from this uh, presentation first, is that the MySQL is mature. For many problems, solutions are available and you can essentially take off-the-shelf architecture, go ahead and be successful with it. The thing important here is what you want to make those few choices right at the beginning, because if you don't, having some architecture mistakes, fix it later, maybe tens or even hundreds of times more expensive than if you could have I think about that in advance. And uh, also you should know what, what the hardware and software uh, uh, advances, raise of the cloud, allow us to go a long way with uh, very simple architectures for MySQL and build pretty large scale and very successful applications. Now before I switch to uh, uh, back to Alisa, a couple of uh, announcements unrelated to this webinar topic. First is we have some wonderful webinars coming up. Uh, the, I mentioned just uh, free out there uh, with MySQL backup and recovery best practices coming on uh, next week. The MySQL uh, uh, monitoring a week after and uh, in July we have uh, the even more common but deadly MySQL development mistake which is a wonderful webinar by uh, Bill Carvin. Check it out and uh, sign up if you find something for your liking. And we would also like uh, to see uh, you for MySQL conference Pircona Live in London, especially if you haven't had a chance to uh, attend the conference in Santa Clara in April because you live closer to Europe. There, Pircona Live in London in November is your great chance. It is a very good time to buy tickets now because prices will increase in Ju starting July 13th. And on this note, thank you. And Alice, it's all yours. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody, if you have questions for Peter, go ahead and enter them into uh, the window, the Go to Webinar control panel under questions. Um, and we have just a couple of questions so far, Peter, and I'm sure there'll be more coming in. How, how uh, mature is MySQL to handle spatial data? How mature is MySQL to handle uh, spatial data? Well, I, I think it's, uh, that is a very um, uh, interesting question. Uh, because there are multiple ways you can uh, structure handling spatial data in uh, the, in uh, in MySQL, their support for geo uh, for this data with uh, spatial indexes uh, have been for m only my sum in in, uh, in years, and that is has been their really sore point. And uh, right now. Uh, there is a lot of work going in the MySQL 5.7 to uh, take a lot of those uh, functionality to in the DB, which will become a lot better built in. Uh, at this point, we often help uh, customers to design JS applications of MySQL by uh, building some uh, supplementary indexes uh, on InnoDB tables because MySum doesn't really scale for large data sizes or uh, high volume workloads. Okay, thank you. The next question is, um, is the compression feature of InnoDB, InnoDB available in MySQL 5.5? Well, uh, the compression for InnoDB is, uh, is available starting in uh, InnoDB plugin, which was available for MySQL 5.1, MySQL 5.5, then it's uh, a, a compression started to be more 
uh, uh, more mature. But if you are running looking at the compression, I would be really looking at the MySQL 5.6 because uh, there is such a tremendous change uh, between 5.5 and 5.6 and compression in MySQL 5.6 is so much so much better for an ADB. Uh, Okay. Um, the next question. I hope I understand this. Um, how good? How good is MySQL for saving multi-language data? MySQL and the multi-language data. Well, uh, MySQL has a support for uh, the for Unicode, which is uh, something what you want to be uh, uh, to be using is if you're solving multi-language uh, data, and uh, like there are many many international applications which uh, sh uh, store the data from probably like many hundreds languages. Well, again, think fa Facebook, uh, which are using MySQL. So uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't expect any problems out there. Uh, having said that, is you may need uh, in some cases uh, even MySQL or some of the uh, programming language you are using may be uh, may be configured to use uh, Latin one encoding, and you need to do configuration changes to uh, to be able to do it effectively. Okay. Thank you. Next question. You talked about having 10 terabytes of data in one MySQL instance. What if you have many smaller databases with a large amount of tables each, say like 800? How many mm -hmm. databases would be a good number per instance? Well, uh, the, uh, that is a good uh, uh, good point. There is uh, no exact uh, limit right uh, out there it uh, a little bit depends on uh, on the application uh, uh, here I can tell you what I've seen successful application which would have more than a million uh, tables on the instance right and this is the number of tables which I would be looking at of uh, their database they are essentially as a as a directories, unless you have some very old file system which have limit of how many directories you can have in MySQL database, uh, there is not going to be much uh, problem having uh, having many databases. Great. Next question: How much performance penalty for NoDB compression do you think there is? How much performance for uh, NoDB compression? Well, uh, this is uh, actually is a very, uh, very complicated question, right? As with many of those uh, advanced algorithms, and that will be very much workload uh, related. First of all, uh, you should know what if compression uh, rights often become more uh, expensive to a higher proportion than reads. Right, because uh, uh, when you have many writes, sooner or later you'll have to essentially uh, uh, decompress the data. The second piece is uh, uh, the penalty can be uh, a little bit more when you you don't have enough uh, enough memory, because then MySQL will uh, have to uncompress uh, uh, pages a lot. If there is enough memory, then MySQL will be able to store both compressed and uncompressed versions of page in its buffer pool and what that means is what your reads will essentially have no performance penalty when they uh, hit the same uncompressed pages as they would in any in any case do okay next question do you have any recommendations for best practices for warehouse environments oh well the, the Warehouse environments uh, uh, that is uh, like really such a such a big topic, right? So you, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I, I can't really describe the best practice in a few words. Beyond is what you need to understand uh, what your needs are. Are you going to do some of the well-defined reports or are those uh, ad hoc queries? Perhaps the good. Uh, idea would be is to make sure to prototype your database, load that if a test data and see how it behaves. Right? For certain uh, workloads, MySQL may be 
uh, working very well, especially with the changes to optimizer in uh, uh, in MySQL 5.6. In some cases, it wouldn't be uh, able to handle that well, uh, right? And then you may uh, need to go to some uh, solutions in the MySQL space or outside of MySQL space. Now, in the MySQL space specifically, uh, not everybody recognizes this, but the MySQL has some very uh, interesting column level storage engines which are av available for that, which would allow you to essentially continue using the MySQL uh, protocol for your system, even though all the optimizing and execution is done uh, completely different way with completely different performance. Infobrite and the InfiniDB are two of such column store engines which I would uh, suggest to research if you're looking for large-scale data warehousing with MySQL. Okay, and then I think we have time for one more question, um, and this might be a larger topic, Peter, but I thought I would ask it anyhow. How can we use MySQL with MongoDB? Oh, well, that's an interesting topic. How do we uh, how do we use uh, MySQL with MongoDB? I think the uh, most common uh, successful way I have seen is using MySQL alongside with MongoDB where you uh, use different data stores for uh, different use cases where they uh, do really excel. So for example, somebody mentioned here about their uh, GIS functionality in the MySQL. Well, and you know, Frankly, MySQL was uh, lagging behind in MySQL support, and for some applications, MongoDB can be uh, can be used much better for those kind of applications, right? To be able to, I don't know, let's say, uh, edit drive to to find the data in uh, in their in the proximity, uh, and then you may still continue to use MySQL as your a transactional data store, for example, to store the order right, <clears throat> the information about payments and so on and so forth. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for answering questions. Folks, Peter will uh, address any questions that were not covered in a follow-up blog post on MySQL Performance blog. Thank you so much for your time today, Peter. It was a great presentation. I have rave reviews and very positive feedback. And everybody, thank you so much for attending. Like Peter said, we have quite a robust webinar program this summer, and we would enjoy seeing you in, in those sessions. And thank you for attending. I hope that you have a wonderful day, evening, or morning, depending on where you're calling in from. Peter, thank you again. Thank you.